Hello to you all. My name is Sidney Lambert Lalit, and I'm a lecturer at IFP School, specialized in CO2 economics and energy transition. This session will be dedicated to review what transport could look like in the future, how we can overcome the many challenges that we have introduced in previous weeks, and what are the solutions already or soon to be available in the transport sector. We will discuss the need to decarbonize our mobility, how to improve energy efficiency of vehicles, but also the role of city planning and changes in our mobility habits to help us make mobility more sustainable. Let me start by reminding some of the main challenges hanging over the transport sector that has been depicted in previous lessons. I can think of five of them. First, greenhouse gases and notably CO2 emissions released in the atmosphere through gasoline or diesel oil combustion. The transport sector accounts for 14% of global man-made greenhouse gases and thus need to be part of the solution. Second, fuel availability and cost. For instance, gasoline and diesel oil prices in the United States have almost doubled in the last decade. In France, the average household dedicates 10 to 15% of its revenue to automobile. The French automobile budget has grown by 64% since 1990. Then come three more local issues. First, local air pollution. Maria has showed it very clearly during the first week of this course. When reaching up to certain levels, exhaust from fuel combustion can be a threat for public health. Second, traffic congestion, as the average driver lost approximately eight working days in traffic congestion in 2012, according to TomTom's traffic index. And finally, urban parking, as two out of three human beings and potential car users we live in a city by the middle of this century. Space availability and time spent to find a parking spot will be a major issue. These challenges can be summarized through a very simple equation, derived from the Kaya equation. Yoichi Kaya, a Japanese economist, gave its name to an equation that showed all the factors influencing the growth of greenhouse gases emissions. Here, we'll try to apply this equation to the transport sector. Let me just call the emissions from all vehicles TCO2. We should all agree that TCO2 equals TCO2. Starting from this equation, we can multiply and divide one term by the same factor without changing the equilibrium. TCO2 equals then TCO2 over T energy times T energy, where T energy stands for the energy consumed in the transport sector. Going further in this equation, we can say that TCO2 equals TCO2 over T energy times T energy over kilometers, the distance traveled by all vehicles, times kilometers over vehicles times vehicles, where vehicles is the total number of vehicles on the road. In concrete words, we can say that the emissions from the transport sector can be viewed as the product of four factors, the carbon intensity of energy, the energy intensity per kilometer, the average distance traveled by each vehicle, and the global fleet of vehicles in the world. If we need to divide our emissions by three by 2050, as most climate scientists tell us, we'll have to divide by three at least one of these four factors, the others remaining constant. These four factors can be seen as the main levies we have to act on to drive our transport system onto a more sustainable pathway. Indeed, the term TCO2 over T energy, or the carbon intensity of energy used to fuel our cars, has been viewed in details in previous sessions. As 97% of the transport sector still rely on oil, this advocates for a profound fuel switch towards hybrid cars, biofuels, or battery electric vehicles. But is electrifying transport the solution? Let's not forget as Prakash has clearly highlighted in his session, that electric vehicles are as clean as the electricity mix used to power the cars. For instance, an electric vehicle powered with coal-based electricity will lead to a 40% increase of well-to-wheel CO2 emissions in comparison with the average emission level of cars sold in the European Union last year. For natural gas-based electricity, it will only reduce emissions by 15%. The issue 
is that coal account today for 41% of the global electricity mix, natural gas for 22 and oil for 5%, and that the power sector represents one quarter of the man-made greenhouse gases emissions. Based on this type of electricity mix, electrifying all personal vehicles will have no major impact on the global carbon dioxide emissions. Decarbonizing mobility first needed the carbonization of the energy mix. The second term of the equation, the energy intensity per kilometer, is a good way to describe overall energy efficiency of a vehicle. This has also been reviewed in details by Maria last week, improving on the one hand the energy content of existing fuels and on the other hand, the efficiency of motors will help us reduce fuel consumption. Fuel efficiency of vehicles have greatly improved in recent years and more and more stringent standards are set. China, for instance, aims at improving fuel efficiency of vehicles by more than 40% between 2012 and 2020. Reduction in weight, improve aerodynamics and reduce rolling resistance of cars can help decrease further the fuel consumption of vehicles. Also, eco-driving, where drivers adapt their driving habits to optimize engine performances, can help reduce fuel consumption by 10 to 15 percent. One of these solutions, named GECO, is discussed in a short interview available in this week's support materials. The third term of the equation the average distance traveled by vehicle is a matter of lifestyles and city planning. Historically, human settlements began with people clustered around a well, and the size of that settlement was roughly the distance one could walk with a pot of water on its head. That remained unchanged for thousands of years. Then, with industrialization, everything started to become centralized. Dirty factories were moved to the outskirts of cities, Production was centralized in assembly plants, learning at school, shopping in huge malls, and cars, roads, and parking lots were built to connect these areas. This is a pattern often seen in northern American cities. It is what we call urban sprawling. As you can see on the graph on this slide, urban density has a great impact on energy consumption. As a city extends its surface, we observe an increase in demand for mobility, and based on our current mobility system, it will inevitably increase energy consumption. By 2050, at least 2 billion additional people will live in cities, whether these cities already exist or not. The urban planning model chosen will have a great impact on energy consumption and emissions. Telecommuting can also be a good way to reduce our need of mobility. Telecommuting, or telework, can be defined as a work arrangement in which employees do not commute to a central place of work. They can work from home, from public libraries, from shared offices close from where they live. In our societies, where more and more interactions are based on services, do we really need to take our car every day to go to work? The development of such a work arrangement reduced the need for mobility, the kilometers traveled, hence transports CO2 emissions. But telework has also proven benefits on working time and productivity. A study conducted by the Danish Technological Institute shows that telecommuting, up to 50% of the global working time, increases labor productivity. Finally, if we focus on the last term of the equation, the number of vehicles available on the road, we already know many levers to optimize our mobility system. The question is, what are we ultimately looking for in a car? Is it the position or is it the service of mobility? In the middle of the 20th century, owning a car was a sign of wealth and social success. But today more and more people would rather purchase a service of mobility than a car. We need to keep in mind that, on average, a car is on the road only 5% of the time. Carpooling and car sharing services have boomed in recent years as an answer to this problem. It has made possible to use more efficiently an already existing network, the road. Carpooling can be defined as a sharing of a car journey, so that more than one person travels in a car. The owner of the car is generally one of the travelers. This is different from car sharing, in which a fleet of cars is jointly owned by the users. 
Carpooling exploits the car already owned by people, while car sharing exploits cars but precisely for the group. Carpoolers mutualize the travel cost, energy consumption, and emissions, while car sharers mutualize the fixed cost of the vehicle, purchase of the car, insurance, maintenance. Last but not least, efficient, available, affordable, and clean public transport is crucial for reducing the energy per capita required for transport. When choosing their means of transportation, people will compare the cost, availability, reliability, and comfort of each system. These are all the factors that will convince them to shift from privately owned and privately used car towards a more collective and sustainable mobility system. In the end, these are all the ways we can act on to reduce emission while satisfying our growing needs of mobility. But remember, other challenges are at stake. Energy consumption, traffic congestion, local air quality, parking. The good news is, all the solutions presented before have multiple benefits and contribute to tackle these challenges as well. If the benefit is not certain for global emissions, Electric vehicles definitely have a positive impact over local air pollution, in part caused by diesel exhaust from vehicles. Telecommuting and shared mobility help reduce the number of vehicles on the road, hence reducing traffic congestion and need of parking infrastructure. A smart urban design and availability of efficient collective modes of transportation also reduce traffic, need of parking, local pollution and fuel consumption. People respond to incentives, whether based on cost, on time, or comfort. No one likes to be caught in traffic, to spend time looking for a parking spot or thousands of euros for fueling its car. We know the solutions. Some are already here, technically available and affordable. And they can benefit to each of us and to society as a whole. Incentives need to be properly implemented to help society trigger this shift from an individual and outdated transport system into a more collective, more efficient and more sustainable mobility pathway. Let me conclude by mentioning the role of internet and new communication technologies as key elements for supporting this shift. New mobile applications are developed every day to help people find an available parking spot, to calculate the fastest route for a journey, to book a car shared by multiple users or for connecting carpoolers. It can also help you change your driving habits and help you drive in a more energy efficient way. By the way, if you want to know more about how new communication technology can boost eco-driving behaviors, do not hesitate to look at the video on Jeco, one of the most recently developed applications for eco-driving. That's it for me now. Thank you for your time. You've been great.